Well, good morning and welcome to Redeemer Reformed Church this Sunday morning. We have the pleasure of welcoming Joel Trinidad and his family again to bring the Lord's message to us. And we um, have a couple of announcements before we get going. Today is the question and answer session that we would like folks to stick around for after the service. So maybe 10 minutes after the morning service, that might give you enough time to get your coffee. Come back in and we'll, we'll open up that discussion. We thank you for the prayers that have been made in anticipation of this event and um, messages received. We thank you for your thoughtful consideration and discernment in this matter. And now we'll have a chance to talk about it as a congregation. Also on the calendar is our annual cleaning day, which is set for May 4th. So mark your calendars for that and um, help out our church in getting our building adjusted and ready for the, for the, the year ahead. Uh, prayer requests. There's a few in the bulletin. Um, I want to highlight thankfulness for Liz, that she is doing much better. So thank you for her for prayers in that regard. And, uh, and, and just keep in prayers the um, search process for our new pastor. We're going to begin our worship service with a hymn of meditation. That will be hymn 227. It's a hymn we don't sing, but it is a hymn we meditate on. So the accompanist will play through two verses, and please keep this in your hearts and minds as we prepare ourselves to worship. Happy Lord's Day, brothers and sisters in Christ. Safely through another week, God has brought us on our way. Let us now a blessing seek, waiting in his courts today. Day of all the week, the best emblem of eternal rest. Christ is risen today. It's the first day of the week, and we await that final first day where we shall enter God's eternal rest. So please stand, if you are able, as we read God's word for our call to worship. Hear now God's word. O oh God, you are my God. 
earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Beloved congregation, from where does our help come? Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us sing all things bright and beautiful, number 251. pray. Our good God and (coughs) our creator, you have made all things and all things beautiful. You have made, (coughs) you have made us in your image. 
to reflect your beauty and majesty. You have given us eyes to see the rest of your creation, and you have given us lips that we might tell <coughs> that we might tell how how great our God Almighty is, who has made all things well. The cold wind and the winter, and the pleasant summer sun, though there are changes in the seasons, you remain the same, O oh Lord. Receive our worship <coughs> today as your creation. And as your people, may your name be glorified, the church edified, the discouraged comforted, and Christ exalted in our midst. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Amen. Open with me in hymnal uh, 851 as we all together confess the Apostles' Creed faithful summary of the scripture. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Sing together hymn 456, Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners.
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, verse 17 to 24. Ephesians 4, 17 to 24, for the reading of God's word. Hear now God's word. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And we thank you, Jesus, for being friends with sinners like us, and thank you for being lover of our souls. Thank you for you are our strength in, in weakness and in our failing. And thank you for you are our help in sorrow and when our hearts are breaking. Thank you for you are the comfort of our souls. Thank you for amidst the storms of life, you hear our cry. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for keeping us and loving us till the end. Father, forgive us when we sin against you and your word. Father, forgive us when we doubt your goodness. Forgive us when we fail to hold on to your promises. May you forgive us when our hearts are divided and when we do not have a singular devotion toward you. And we thank you for your mercies. We thank you because in your Son, our Savior and Lord, we have been forgiven. Help us to walk according to your ways and help us to live according to your will. Father, help us to use your word as the rule of our faith and obedience, especially in this dark and broken world that we live in. We pray for this world where sinful people who do not believe you walk in the futility of their minds. Their understanding of who you are and your works are darkened by their self-serving principles. We pray for them. In their ignorance due to the hardness of their hearts have given themselves up to sensuality and impurity we pray for them as you call them to repentance, as you save them from their sins. And we pray that you use us, use your church, use your people to point them to the truth, which is in Jesus Christ alone. Help us as we put off our old self and to be salt and light to the people around us. Help us to be bold and live our lives with renewed mind by putting on the new self, being like our, our God in holiness and righteousness. May our neighbors, may the community around us see in our lives and through our lives the testimony of your 
greatness and of your goodness. We pray for your people in this place. Father, we pray that you meet us, meet with us where, where we are in our lives. And may the troubles in, the li in life point us to you as our deliverer. May the blessings in life point us to you as the source of all good things. And you as our sustainer. May the pains in this life point us to you as our comforter. May the confusions in this life point us to, to your son Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. And may the overwhelming responsibilities in our lives, at home, in our vocation, point us to you as our peace and our strength. And may the struggles with temptations point us to you as our sanctifier. Meet us where we are, Father, even as we hear your word proclaimed to us today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We will be singing hymn 530, Teach, my, teach Me Thy Way, O Lord, for the hymn of preparation. Our text for today's sermon is in Joel chapter 1, the whole chapter 1. We will be reading the whole chapter 1. This is the first of five sermons in a series. I, I'll be preaching the first sermon today. I don't have any schedule yet to be back here, and I hope that will tell Andy that he should invite me back for the rest of the sermon series, I guess. But uh, before we read uh, a little news from, from the Trinidad's, 
our internship will be in uh, Pella, Iowa. Um, we are so excited to go there. And uh, it's a CRC congregation, a big CRC congregation, a very conservative congregation. And uh, we thought uh, that uh, we'd share that with you just in case you like to go to, you know, you want to journey to the Mecca. We will be there. We will be, we will be waiting for you. We'll tell you all the stories. You get to buy us Dutch pastries, and uh, we'll have a fun uh, in fellowship anyways. So we will be reading Joel chapter 1. Hear now God's word. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Give ear. All inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweetest wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped, stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made wide. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of, of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The, se the seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate. The granaries are, are torn down because the grain has dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of the sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness and flame has burned. All the trees of the field, even the beasts of the field, pant for you because the water brooks are dried up. And fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, as we open your holy word this morning, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our access to information gives us an advantage what to pray for in this world, right? Particularly what's wrong with it. But sensory overload, you know, all the things we see through our screen phones, our laptops, our televisions, etc., all the things we hear from news online or news from warm bodies around us, all the things that we feel whenever we see and hear all the information 
you know, anger toward the bad guys in politics, in the streets, in other parts of the world. Happiness as we see our college basketball team win and secure the spot in the finals. Excitement if, you know, Caitlin Clark is going to give South Carolina their first loss in a championship game this afternoon. Rejoicing with now pregnant friend from 8,000 miles away because of Facebook, right? And hitting that hard react. Being overly stimulated has its tendency to make us get used to all the good news. And especially the bad. That instead of making us care, it makes us indifferent. We get used to it. When God sent the locust swarm to Judah, the devastation they saw with their eyes, the crying of suffering people that they heard, the smell of fear from their children, the hunger and the taste of death they feel. There was only one thing to do, care. Caring for what's happening around us means praying for the salvation of sinners. The justice against evil people. Repentance for the wayward. Love for the oppressed. Sunday school time this morning, we heard of wonderful opportunities to go into those kind of communities that need help. And that's caring. Appreciation for a church that proclaims good news and mourning for the brokenness of this world. Did you know that the yearly revenue of the immoral film industry in the United States is bigger than the yearly revenue of NBA, NFL, and MLB combined? To be exact, it's almost three times. Did you know that one out of four children in America is fatherless? Did you know that in 2020, there were almost a million abortions in the U.S. alone? Did you know that there are 22 million images of child pornography? There is a 5,000 increase over the last five years in this industry. It is the fastest international crime that the world has ever seen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these are but a speck of the observable devastations that sin brings into this world, into God's world, our world, our family, our community, our congregants, and our nation. This nation, which is a self-professing Christian nation, and leaders who call themselves Christians. The Philippines, for example, is the only Christian nation in Asia, but it's the fourth most corrupt country in Southeast Asia, and it's perceived as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Whatever happened to these nations who claim to be people of God? In the first chapter of Joel, the people of Judah are in trouble. Locust swarms have come and it comes as a judgment from God. They must return to God. And brothers and sisters in Christ, let us not forget that while we, God's beloved people, are comforted by the truth that God forgives, He is just, and He shall not leave the guilt unpunished. Moses understood the balance of this when he said, God is keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. We can say that the prophet Joel is a, is a woke prophet, you know, not in a bad way woke. He looked around and immediately he knew that people were in trouble and they needed to repent of their sins and return to God. And this morning, like the prophet Joel, let us be woke people 
aware of sin within our own hearts and sin's effects without and around us. And let us turn to God for salvation while also being a signpost for others to find their way to God. Now, the only, the only thing we know about Prophet Joel, aside from it's a very good name, is that he is the son of Pethuel. That's it. Many have speculated when this book was written, maybe they're right or wrong, uh, the simple answer is that we do not know exactly. And not knowing concrete details about the book and the prophet himself makes it challenging for us to understand the context. And as we all know, context is king. Therefore, we can also say that God has probably intended it to be that way. That what we see here, these observable devastating effects of sin, has been there since the fall and will always be present in all epochs in history in this time and age until the second coming of Jesus Christ, or what this book eventually, as we move through in our series, Lord willing, would refer to as the day of the Lord. This world is the context of the message of God's prophet. And so let me propose three concrete calls to, to action from our passage. The first point is hear and tell. The second point is awake and lament. And the third point, repent and call to the Lord. These are all the imperatives that we can see in the whole chapter. These are the three main sections divided by the main imperatives. The first point is hear and tell. Verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. The first five words are foundational to the whole book the word of the lord this is very encouraging brothers and sisters god has not abandoned his people his word is still proclaimed regardless of their sins yes the locust swarm shall rampage through all this that is living and and, and kill them but god in his word can speak life bring life, sustain life, and spare life from destruction. So hear his word. This tells us several truths. Number one, God is present even in brokenness and in darkness. As we look around us, it's dark, it's broken, but God is still present. Number two, God's word warns. Yes, but also it washes. The fact that there was still the prophet Joel as the mouth, as acting as the mouthpiece of God, even though his opening message was about punishment for his people's sinfulness, his presence and his word assure God's people of deliverance and his compassion. The prophet Joel asked a question, Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? In verse 2, by asking this question, people were made to reflect on their sins against God and how it might be related to a particular sin that God, punish, that God used to punish people in the past. And that is through the, the same devastating locust swarms. Now that's a clue probably with how we should understand the purpose of the locust swarm. There is no doubt that the locust swarms are punishment for their sins and that God is calling them to repentance. We can see that in verse 14. Consecrate a fast, cry out to the Lord, and then verse 15, as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Now let me read verses 3 to 4, which is the initial description of that destruction. Tell your children about it, and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. 
the devastations that the locust swarms brought about the people of God and their land are so severe that it should make them not only turn back from their sins, but also let the next three generations know that simple truth, sin destroys. The imagery of locusts at the, as the judgment was you know, known to be used against Egypt as the eight of the ten plagues. And it's probably what the prophet was referencing in verse 2. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? But the prophet Joel in this book speaks to God's people in God's land. That's the difference. Notice that. He was prophesying against God's enemies. He was prophesying against God's people. One key literary style among the Old Testament prophets, rhetoric is called satirical parody. It was a mockery. Israel witnessed in the past how God intervenes and saves them from their enemies through such means and methods and never against God's own people. And Joel seems to say, well, I guess we have come to this. A punishment for God's enemies is poured out to us his people. See the parallelism here between the locust swarm in, the, in, the, in this book and in the book of Exodus. Let me read from Exodus chapter 10. They shall cover the face of the land, speaking about the locust, so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Exodus chapter 10 verse 3 tells us God's word to Pharaoh. How long will you refuse to humble yourself? Remember verse 2, it was a reflective question. What was Pharaoh's sin, which is unbelief, is the same sin that God's people have committed. Joel is calling people to humble themselves and turn to God for salvation. Pharaoh's unbelief was punished. The people of God will also be punished because of their unbelief. Now, what is unbelief? What is its relationship to a hard heart like Pharaoh's and God's call to his people for repentance? Let me define it in a way that the kids could understand it. Unbelief is not trusting God and his word. When we do not trust God and his word, guess what happens? We trust our own hearts and our own words. The Bible tells us that our hearts can be deceitful. It can be selfish, self-serving. We need to trust God more than anyone else, more than ourselves, because He knows best. Always listen to God and His Word. God speaks to us in several ways. He speaks to us every Lord's Day when we listen to the preaching of our pastor. He speaks to us when our Sunday school teaches, teachers teach us his word. He speaks to us when our parents read to us his word or remind us of what God says in his word. Pray for us and with us God's word. And even when we sing psalms and hymns, let us trust God and his word. To all of us, our parents, I encourage all of us to talk with our kids about the preaching that we hear every Lord's Day. Summarize it for them. Come up with applications that are sensible to them and are concrete for them. Also, make time for family worship. Now, my, my kids' favorite part of our family worship is hymn singing. Everyone gets to pick one hymn every night. Uh, we all have our favorite hymns, and most of them are in our bulletin today. However, our youngest son only has Gloria Patri in his repertoire. Now, the cure to unbelief 
is to immerse ourselves in the word of God. Hear him speak. Hear him speak. And the book of Joel may paint a dark sky as the locust swarms dim the light of the sun, if you will, but the sun is there to stay. This is the most comforting truth in this book. God has never abandoned his people. God was not silent. God has spoken. Hear and speak of it. Even amidst the locust swarms, God still speaks. Even amidst the degradation of the morals in our society, liberalism in our politics, and liberalism creeping into the pews and pulpits of Christian denominations, God's word is still more powerful to save and transform. And Isaiah captures this truth by saying, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So hear and tell. Hear and tell, brothers and sisters, in Christ. Give importance to God's word. Give importance to the preaching of God's word, to the teaching of God's word. It is the power of God for the salvation of sinners. But the word here in verse 2 also denotes obeying. This message requires a response, a resolve, an obedience. And the same goes for whenever we listen to God's word. We take heed. We listen. We pay attention and we obey. What we do next? What do we do next after hearing and he heeding God's word and warning? And number two, point number two, awake and lament. You see that in verses 5 to 12. The swarming locusts, if you have ever seen them in person, I have not. It's so funny that the day I finished writing this sermon, Facebook reminded, that, reminded me of a memory 11 years ago, and I was, eating, I was eating spicy fried locusts in the salad uh, part of the Philippines. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, it was scary for Judah. Southern Philippines, it was a buffet for them. <laughs> I have not yet... I have not seen a locust swarm. But if you have ever watched them on the internet, or it's a sight to behold. And not in a good way. It is, as verse 4 tells us, a destroying locust. It is powerful and beyond in number. We can sense the urgency from the prophet Joel of the command in verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Have you ever tried waking up a drunk person? Exactly. Was the prophet Joel speaking to actual drunkards among God's people? Probably. But it's also possible that he is describing the state of their spirituality. Scripture is pretty clear in using the image of drunkenness as a description of a person who is indulging in the desire of the flesh. It always has a negative connotation and is often, often contrasted with being filled with the Spirit. For example, in Ephesians 5.18, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, interestingly, wine is also used as an image of celebration, wisdom, and blessing particularly in the book of Proverbs. Drinking wine, for example, was essential in those days for their health, for religious practices, and for community celebration and consumption. Wine was not the problem. The abuse of it was. Blessings are not supposed to be an end in themselves. Right? Blessings have two purposes. To show that God is the source of all good and perfect gifts. Second, there is no blessing that could fully satisfy, satisfy our longings. Therefore, blessings point you to the one, to the only one who can fill your cup. Now, the second part of verse 5 signifies taking from God's people the opportunity to drink and enjoy the blessings of life as punishment. It says here, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. The locust swarms destroyed 
the vineyard, wine barrels were empty. No time and resources to celebrate life and love. Aren't that what sin do to us? Sin tricks us into thinking that gratifying the flesh brings satisfaction. No, it only brings sorrow, despair, misery, and emptiness. Look how verses 6 to 7 describe it. A nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made wine. The locust swarms are likened to a rampaging and colonizing nation, killing everything that has life and everything that gives and sustains life. Wine being cut off from our mouths is figuratively saying that sin destroys lives. It takes away our joy. It disrupts our peace and quiet. They are replaced by misery, hopelessness, helplessness, and death. Sin even makes the sweetest wine bitter. And John Owen said, Sin aims always at the utmost. It is like the grave that is never satisfied. On the other hand, we might think that you know, I am preaching to the choir. We might think that we are okay just because we have not committed grievous sins. We have not forsaken church. And we regularly pray and read our Bibles, so we are okay. But this is also applicable to our indifference, to the people who are living in sin around us. When we do not remember them in our prayers, when we do not mourn for them before God. This may be applicable to our temper, our mood swings, our impatience, to our kids, to our workmates, to our annoying family members or classmates. There is, a, there is never a justification for a bad temper, normatively. These what we call little sins could be those few locusts jumping around, and if not dealt with, could bring about a locust swarm. The effects of sin, the effects of sins, how big or little they may be, have effects. They usually, people around us gets affected. That is another, uh, another one of the devastating effects of sin. The sin of, the, of one affects many, and that is what verses 8 to 12 are all about. From a drunkard in verse 5. Now the desolation and the destructive effects of sin have affected other people. For example, the priests and the ministers in verse 10. The tillers of the soil and the vine dressers in verse 11. And the children of men in verse 12. It's only a matter of time before a whole pile of fresh tomatoes is cor corrupted when mixed with a rotten wine. This is a really sad this depiction of how powerful and destructive sin is. Its effects are always widespread. How many marriages and families have been destroyed by just one foolish decision? One wrong move could turn the family tree upside down. The cutting locusts, the swarming locusts, and the destroying locusts in verse 4 do not just happen. Guess how it happens? One locust hopping around, affecting one another to hop around. And that is literally the science how locust swarms start. The science of locust swarm was described like this. Let me read. Locusts are actually a group of short-horned grasshoppers they are usually solitary, fairly bland-looking insects, but they can switch into a gregarious mode, becoming social, multicolored eating machines that sweep across the landscape in swarms up to, of up to 80 million locusts per square kilometer. 
it is a fascinating description of people who think they can get away with their sins and their private sins, but they are sorely mistaken. Jesus himself said, your sins will find you out. There is no such thing as hidden sin. No sin is ever committed in secret because first, God knows everything. Second, it will show in and through our thoughts, words, and deeds. And people around us will be affected. Brothers and sisters, sin hurts us and those who are around us. Look at verse 12, one of the saddest realities that sin brings into the world. And gladness dries up, that is the wine, from the children of men. You see, the world hates limitations, right? especially this generation. This world hates limitations because they are killjoy. Is it really? Committing to one person in marriage and together building a family, you know, raising up little Joels and Jaycees, if that's what limitation is, I'll take it any day. Committing to a church and journeying with brothers and sisters in Christ in their rejoicing and in their grieving and being subject to spiritual disciplines which will take care of my spiritual life and my families, if that is limiting, that I want to be limited. The world hates limitations because it is killjoy. No, sin kills joy. Gladness dries up from the children of man. Freedom outside of God's limitation is bondage to the flesh. A grave that is never satisfied. And this brings us to our third point. Repent and call to the Lord. Now these two important imperatives are the resolves of the prophet Joel. Repent and call to the Lord. And we see this in the whole book actually. The difference in the pronouns used here, not in a bad way use of pronouns, is notable. For example, in verses 13 to 14, the pronouns are in the second person plural. It was a command directed to a group of people. Interestingly, to the church, to the congregation, to the ministers, the priests. If you look at verses 19 to 20, the pronouns are first person singular. It was a personal resolution. Now, in between those um, pericopes are verses eight, 15 to 18. The prophet in verses 15 to 18 simply reiterated the desolation and destruction that sin has brought to the land. But he also referenced for the first time the term the day of the Lord in verse 15, which, Lord willing, we will talk about in, this, uh, in the second sermon. Repent and call to the Lord. Those are the two concrete practical actions regarding the repentance of our sins. And it's viewed in, in, two, in two lenses. First is our cor corporate confession and repentance of sin. Second is our personal and perpetual calling to the Lord for salvation. They are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. Corporate and private Confession and repentance of sin. Now let's look at verses 13 to 14. Our, cor or our corporate confession and repentance of sin. It says here, Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Now, interestingly, in chapter 2 at the beginning, you will see there a very important image. Blow a trumpet in Zion from the gathering of the elders and the priests and the assembly into the blowing of the trumpet outward. Now, this is probably the clearest description in the scripture of the church's role in our confession of our sins and 
our repentance of our sins. Interestingly, in the Old Testament, right, it's a calling of the assembly, a corporate confession of sin. Now, I am a pastor's kid. My parents were missionaries, and they have served in a lot of churches. There is a very interesting observation regarding how some Christians view the repentance of sins. There were too many to count instances where I have heard people say that they wanted to lay low from the church and the church gatherings because they wanted to deal with their sins or struggles with sins first before going back into the fellowship. That is not the proper way to view the role of the church in the repentance of our sins. Our church is concerned and is more than willing to help us in our sanctification. You have heard it said, and it is, and it is true, the church is not a museum for the saints. It is a hospital for sinners. Because there is no ordinary possibility of salvation outside the church normatively as the Westminster Confessions puts it, but at the same time, it is true with our sanctification. Sanctification is normatively accomplished corporately. That's an important point. Our sanctification is first and foremost a congregational work before it is a personal pursuit. And I hope and I pray that we continue to view our church as it continues to be concerned with our sanctification. So talk to your elders if you are struggling with sin and you know you need help. If you struggle with assurance because of your shortcomings, come here and diligently use the ordinary means of grace. That is why the means of grace were given. God knows we are weak. And God delights in assuring us of His grace, His love, His forgiveness, and His mercy through the means of grace. If you want accountability, find a trusted friend in this sanctuary. Lay hold of the benefits that God gives you through being a member of this wonderful congregation. Confession and repentance of sin are corporate, and second, and they are personal. Verses 19 to 20. To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flames has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. We see here, sin brings suffering to people. And in the scripture, while it is true that all human sufferings, and because of the fallenness and the brokenness of this world, it also teaches us a very practical theology of suffering that brings about faith. Suffering points us to a deliverer. Suffering tells us that we need a savior, a deliverer from that fire which has devoured the pasture of the wilderness and burned all the trees of the field, verse 19. Suffering also tells us that sin makes a false promise of pleasure. Sufferings turn our soul toward God for satisfaction. In verse 20, we can see that. Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up. So sin is grave and is never satisfied. As John Owen said it. But our Savior has conquered the grave. He is mighty to save. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, as you return to your vocation this week, lay hold of your Savior. He will see you through as you face temptations. The Holy Spirit will help you with your weaknesses. Call to Him. As you lead your family in the faith, Lay hold of your Savior and proclaim Him and His work to your children. As you await the next Lord's Day, make sure to schedule pit stops, if you will, 
along the way where and when you can call to God privately. Hear him and his word in your private devotions. Spend time in, in prayers. Be awakened from your slumber and perpetually confess and repent of your sins, being assured of his forgiveness and love. Let us rep reflect upon the lyrics of the hymn that we are, we're going to sing after we pray before the throne of God above and meditate on the gospel truths that we can find in them. Again, brothers and sisters in Christ, may the observable devastations and destructions that sin has brought into this world, into our country, into our community, gives us the urgency to call to God for our own salvation, for the salvation of our friends, of our family members, and for the salvation of this nation. Let us pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, again we pray that as heavy as the words of Joel were for the people of Judah in those times, May your word this morning awaken us from our slumber. May your word this morning rebuke us of our indifference. May you urge us, Father, to maximize our making use of our resources, our access to information, to know what's going on around the world, to, go, to, to know we're, what we can pray for, who we can pray for, and to know what we can do as your children for the advancement of your, your kingdom building in this broken and dark world. May your word that is proclaimed every Lord's Day, may your word that is being open in family worship, even in, in schools, may your word be powerful to transform our lives, to sanctify us, and to grow us in the knowledge of your grace, and to grow our love for the lost. May your word be used to be proclaimed, to be shared in different means, in different formats, because we know, Lord, that your word is powerful. And as long as your word is being opened, we know that you are mighty to save. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us sing hymn 277 before the throne of God. Stand up if you are able.
through the giving of our offering. Mm -hmm. Please stand for our benediction, after which we will be singing 571, Gloria Patri. Receive now God's blessings through the reading of his word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.